Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we're here for the uh, GIS, uh, Geographic Information Systems. Today we're going to be talking about the uh, advanced certificate program that we have. Or it's new, very new, uh, just started up this fall here at BCIT. Um, I'm Karl Parchik, uh, the program head for uh, GIS, and I'll be sort of giving you the lowdown on that program, uh, as well as we have another instructor uh, at the back, uh, Mike Hill. And uh, at the end of our, my presentation, if you have any questions, you can talk to me or you can talk to Mike and we can answer um, your questions. Uh, we also have um, sort of a video streaming happening at the same time. Uh, and uh, if you hear Mike typing feverishly at the back, it's because people are asking online questions and he's, he's answering them in the background. So let's get into it here now. Oops, there we go. So what are we going to cover today? Uh, just sort of a little bit of background about uh, uh, GIS, then adding uh, the skills, GIS skills, to what you currently are doing, and then some stuff specifically uh, about uh, GIS at BCIT and then at the end we follow up with the questions. So starting off GIS uh, is everywhere. I'm not sure like how much knowledge everybody has uh, about GIS but uh, if you were say here at BCIT and you wanted to go to the convention center uh, by car you may go to the web, go to Google and type in uh, where you are, where you want to be, and Google would generate this drive time map for you. So this, this online drive time map, this is sort of one flavor uh, or one capability of GIS. But it can do a lot more than that. Uh, we also have other things uh, that are happening. Uh, lots of aerial images that uh, combine with the GIS mapping. So this is the the uh, VCIT campus and we are about right in there uh, in the building. Uh, so that image for GIS uh, could come from any kind of airborne platform. Uh, one of the hot ones now are drones or UAVs and we do have those uh, flying around here at BCIT as well. And um, again just web, everything is going to the web, um, GIS is no exception and uh, we've got uh, various kinds of things happening so instead of just looking at a traditional map say a road type map uh, that you look at there's also now all these 3D visualizations that you can do with GIS uh, and there's uh, uh, the CenturyLink field uh, in Seattle and you can move around and take a look at, uh, at more detail and that was uh, in Google Earth there uh, this is what we call uh, a story map. So maps are becoming more interactive and it's not just uh, say turning on and off layers or typing in your address and where you want to go to. Uh, there's one for example this is a story map called Quebec Photo Radar Red Light Cameras. So it actually has the a map as a base but on top of it they have the location of all the red light cameras uh, in the Montreal area and we see all these little red symbols, each one of those symbols uh, is related to a picture and then it can have also say a little video that goes along with it. So GIS is really doing uh, a lot more than just traditional maps in the past. Okay, and um, I think my last example of GIS is everywhere uh, is a municipal uh, example. Uh, this one is from the city of Surrey but if you check probably any of the municipalities in the lower mainland you are going to see a web map. Uh, this one from the uh, the city of Surrey is called uh, Cosmos and uh, in there you can see it has the streets listed. They even show individual trees. Probably if you clicked on one of the trees it would tell you the type of tree, the height of tree, uh, things like that. It shows the footprints of the buildings that make up uh, each one of the lots. So we've got different building lots here as well. And uh, you can highlight one. So uh, Mike had done this screen capture uh, for me. So he highlighted this one particular um, lot. And what it does is it pops up uh, another window with information 
uh, that's available to the public. I think it shows the actual assessed value of that property for the last six or seven years. Um, address, it can show things such as what day garbage collection is. So the cool thing with the GIS, as you may or may not know, is that besides just having the map, you've got all these other kinds of information which are stored in databases that can be linked to the map so you can pull out more information than just uh, you know, taking a look at the map. There's all this additional data that's sitting in the background. Okay, now before I go any further, for everybody that's here, you've probably been eyeing this wonderful BCIT water, um, water jug or water canister. Um, I will be asking a, qu a question at the very end uh, about something in the presentation, and the first person to get the answer right will get that coveted BCIT water, water container. Okay, let's go. Sorry, people out in the internet. Okay, oh, I think I had one more slide here. So spatial data is everywhere. That's the other cool thing. So besides GIS, uh, it's becoming more ubiquitous. It's showing up on the web. Data is what drives GIS. If there's no data, you, you uh, aren't going to do too much interesting things with GIS. And there's a lot of open data. Now, again, say City of Surrey, City of Vancouver, City of Burnaby, lots of municipal data. Um, there's a lot of open source stuff, so you might have heard of something called OpenStreetMap. So they provide streets, so they're trying to cover the entire globe, uh, all the streets for free for people so they don't have to pay for that. And again, with all that data, you know, you can go be mobile as well as stuff on the desktop. Okay, so let's start talking about our advanced certificate in GIS. So as I mentioned, this is a brand new um, program that we are offering and it's meant for people that already have uh, a career. So you could be a civil engineer, you could be an urban planner, but you say, well, I would like to have some extra GIS experience and that, that might be maybe to help you sort of go up. So instead of being a civil engineer level one, you can bump up to a level two or a level three or, or, or something like that. So you, just adding these extra skills to your current um, uh, skills that you have in, in whatever your profession is. Uh, it's not necessarily made to, uh, if you want to change your career completely, it's more like adding to uh, the skills that you have to your current career. So what skills uh, do we offer with our advanced certificate? Well. Um, the first thing that we're going to be uh, learning or you'll learn a lot about is the use of the ArcGIS software. That's probably the most popular uh, GIS software in the world. Um, all, you could say basically all the municipalities, uh, provincial government, federal government, they're all using uh, the ArcGIS software. So we take you through uh, that from uh, the very beginning, how to load data all the way to do some more sophisticated things. Uh, we teach, teach you a little bit about databases and data sets. Uh, I'll go into more of these in a, in a little bit, but uh, learning a little bit of data sets, and I've, I put a word here you may or may not have heard of. Uh, it's called LIDAR. Uh, some of the data sets that we have, or as time has progressed, we were getting more and more data, bigger and bigger volumes. And um, you might have heard the term of big data. So this uh, particular course, we are working with something called big data and one of the big data sets uh, is something called LIDAR. Uh, LIDAR is basically um, an aerial platform say uh, on a helicopter or an airplane and it has a little laser beam on it and it fires down the pulses of laser and that comes back to the sensor and it builds uh, what we call a point cloud and that's you can get hundreds you can get gigabytes and gigabytes of data. That's what they call it, big data. But how do you handle that? So it's a really popular uh, data set now. Uh, how do you handle that? So we'll, we'll take care of showing you uh, things like that. We'll get you into, again, GIS analysis. So you're going to start off with the basics in ArcGIS and get to do more of the uh, sophisticated things that, that go on. Now besides doing sort of this GIS database stuff, you also have to know how to make you know, a proper map. Um, 
So we do have a little bit of, of training for you on cartography. So um, you can just keep hitting the OK button or the default button and you can generate a map, but is that going to be a good map? Probably not. You can uh, very easily, if you don't know what you're doing, you can hide trends in your data. So what we want to do is make sure that you know how to make the best map possible. Uh, and related to that is surveying. So uh, a little bit of info on that. So surveying is one of the data or methods of collecting data that we can then feed into our databases, process with the ArcGIS software, and make good maps with. And the last one uh, talked about a little bit uh, is remote sensing will teach you. So remote sensing is um, I images made from different sources, whether it's from satellite, from helicopter, airplanes, or drones. Okay, I thought I would give a sort of a, a few slides on different types of industries um, that are out there that uh, can use GIS or what they, might, they have been using uh, GIS for. Uh, in the past. Uh, this is not sort of the uh, complete list of everything. This is just what I could fit into one slide. So uh, the first one is uh, for engineers. I worked in an engineering company for, for many years. So um, I've seen how engineering companies do make use of GIS. So I've got a few uh, pictures here on the side to sort of demonstrate some of the points that we have here. Um, one of the ones is uh, planning things, uh, say engineers building a new bridge. So they could be uh, designing that bridge in a CAD system, uh, such as AutoCAD, but then you might want to visualize it, um, put it into context of say where it's crossing a river and what uh, type of vegetation or, or land use uh, is around. So in GIS we can take uh, information such as aerial photography, we can take digital elevation or digital train model data, we can take CAD data, we can put those all together uh, in the GIS, we can visualize it, we can do things like we could drive along that road, we could fly around, do different vantage points. So uh, pretty cool stuff uh, that you can do. So planning uh, and site location type things. Uh, in for things such as environmental analysis or data collection. Uh, we have, again, GIS is gone mobile. So you don't have to have a desktop computer anymore or even a laptop is really uh, old school. You could be having your smartphone and you have the, the GPS uh, turned on on your smartphone or in this case they have a, a pad here. Uh, you can have your GIS data there. If you've got a link, uh, uh, say a, a data link, say you're with Rogers or, or you're with uh, TELUS, uh, you could have a two-way mobile link to a central server in your office where they're live streaming uh, uh, a piece of a map to you and you can go out and you can verify, say you're doing some data collection or verifying what are the assets out uh, in this part or maybe something has moved or you need to, to update that as well. And uh, my last little example here, um, sort of hard to tell what it is, but it's, it's a, um, I think it's a rock crushing facility for uh, a mine. And uh, it could be any kind of, say, a processing plant. And uh, say an engineer, once they've designed that plant, what are you going to do with that, that data set? Say it, it was done in, in AutoCAD. You can do more with it uh, in GIS on the operations and the maintenance side. So bring it, in, it into some things uh, like ArcGIS. You can start managing all those assets. You can find out or monitor where there are trouble, uh, things are breaking down, or what was the, the last time this tank had maintenance done to it. So you can do sort of um, keep track of all the things that you're maintaining. Same thing for things like uh, the bridge. So once that bridge is done, loading it into the GIS, you can use that for uh, ongoing maintenance. So finding out are there certain stretches along this highway where you're always getting potholes or when was the last time some of those, those cables were inspected. Okay, so GIS, uh, lots of things you can do with it uh, on the engineering side. Moving to the municipal, 
a uh, few things that municipal planners uh, can do. So again, these 3D visualizations are becoming super popular and one of the reasons is if you have to go and do things in the public, uh, people can more understand this, they can see trees, they can see roads, they can see cars, they can see the sides of buildings. So having the tools or learning how to do that uh, through uh, the advanced certificate is really going to help with that public uh, participation. Uh, other things that we can do, I have marked down here smart growth. So again, say if you are a municipal planner and a developer says, I want to build this new subdivision, uh, should you say yes or should you say no? Well, you can use, say, the criteria maybe that uh, the developer did to come up with, uh, to take a look at what the suitability rating is for that particular piece of land. Uh, but you could also take a look and say, well, maybe we have an environmental department. And the environmental department looks at things such as where are there salmon-bearing streams or areas that have really steep slopes because you don't want to build uh, on those or you don't want to build too close to those salmon-bearing streams. So for those same areas, you could run a different GIS model and see which areas are good or not so good uh, for development and then you can overlay what the developer would like versus what your environmental department says and come up with the areas that um, fit for both of, of the developer and your environmental concerns. So smart growth, useful. Um, testing scenarios for emergency preparedness. Well, we do have earthquakes here. Um, there are floods that happen. Uh, what's going to happen, uh, say, if there was another, say, a hundred year flood were to uh, happen next year in two years uh, from now, what would, say, the city of Richmond do? Uh, they're only, I think, at three meters above sea level, so if there's a big flood, uh, uh, the Fraser River goes over the banks, where's that water going to go? It might not flood the entire area. There might be certain areas where the water wants to go. So testing scenarios, where should you do sandbags? Or if you, if you raise the dikes, how's that going to help? If, if at all. So um, useful uh, tool to use um, is emergency preparedness. Um, other things, preserving sight lines in CBD. So CBD is Central uh, Business District. So if you think downtown Vancouver. Um, the city of Vancouver does do this, say for new developers. If you're going to be putting up a tower, uh, the city says they want everybody to be able to see the North Shore Mountains. So the developer has to prove that if they put up this tower, that they're not blocking everyone's view that, uh, for the North Shore, uh, North Shore Mountains. So preserving sight lines in the CBD. Again, other things strategically locating emergency services, things like access to schools, uh, where, where are the um, hospitals, things like that. And so that can be, again, related to emergency preparedness scenarios. Okay, so that's municipal planners. Um, and I think this is my last example here, um, how can geologists use? So I worked uh, for many years uh, helping uh, mining companies use GIS and provide them with, with GIS data. So one of the big things for the, the mining people that I worked with was having good exploration maps. Uh, it costs a lot of money to go out and start drilling holes in the ground and looking for gold, but if you have the GIS and you can start loading uh, data, satellite images, geophysical data, other types of information, then you can narrow down that um, uh, where you're going to, to say, go and spend your money during the field season. Uh, reserve estimates, this is, you know, trying to model the ore body, saying, well, yeah, well, we think we've got uh, some gold or silver or whatever we're looking for, but how big is that body? Uh, how many years is that, uh, that mine going to operate? So reserve estimates, uh, again, helping to design uh, that say it's an underground mine. So again, you can use CAD, but it could be CAD with the addition of GIS uh, to it. Uh, once you've extracted out that gold or whatever you have uh, from the mine, what are you going to do with it? Usually, it's it's uh, it's just sort of crushed rock, but it needs, still needs to be processed. It has to go somewhere. It's a processing facility, or it might have to go to a port, and then it gets goes down to the states or uh, Southeast Asia or somewhere is for 
for processing. So uh, the mining company needs to figure out how am I going to go from the mine to that processing facility or that, that port. And it can be uh, the thing that uh, most mines are usually built in pretty places that there isn't a lot of roads to. So you might have to figure out what's the best route through considering I've got mountains or hills and rivers, lakes. So what's my best route? So you can use GIS to help figure out that best route to go from your point A to point B. And lastly, being good mining people, after they've done their exploration and they found everything and they've extracted out the ore, uh, they can use GIS on the mine closure and reclamation. So sometimes they have to do this at the very beginning to, to show uh, to the government that they do have a plan that after they go and they've extracted all the ore out, how are they going to reclaim and what is that area going to look like after the reclamation. Okay. Oh, no, one more. A bonus, a bonus slide. Uh, so this one is, is it the retail? So I'm hoping you're getting because I'm showing all these different things, how wide and varied uh, the capabilities are, or the things that you can do with GIS. So uh, in retail, there's a lot of figuring out where are my customers, um, or the customers that I have, give me some information. Are they, say, 20 to 24 year old single males? They're the ones that spend the most money in my store. Uh, and from that, you say, well, where are all the tw other 20 to 24 year old uh, single males because I should be sending letters or or setting up a new store, a new coffee shop where they are. So GIS can be used to do things like that. So we have uh, examples here, say these are different stores and they're divided up into little polygons of say walk time. Say the 20 to 24 year old male, he only wanna, wants to walk five minutes or ten minutes at most to the nearest coffee shop. So we can, we can calculate things such as walk time or drive time to different sites. Um, uh, distribution and uh, delivery, uh, another type of thing, uh, say let's do Amazon. Amazon is here and they are delivering goods uh, to us. So where does, where does Amazon put their distribution center? Well, they probably had to use a GIS to figure out what location should I put the, pros, uh, the the delivery center here or here or there? Probably what they would have to do, or what I would do is I would take a look at where are most of the people buying from, which parts of the city, and I would like to minimize my driving time because the further I drive, the more it's going to cost me uh, in gasoline. So um, using GIS to figure out where the customers are and then pu putting, putting things like distribution facilities and what's my least amount of driving for me as well as say if I've got 10 different uh, vehicles that are going out and driving. So what's the least cost uh, for that? Okay. Uh, a little bit about BCIT and uh, uh, GIS. So we've been around for a long time since uh, 1987 and uh, our students have uh, sort of started off uh, as GIS technicians as soon as they graduated, but now a lot of them are in management positions and they keep looking for other BCIT GIS grads because they know um, how much we teach. We do a lot of good hands-on uh, education and we're always updating our materials, working with the latest ver version of ArcGIS, uh, for example. And our, our courses are our programs that we're doing. So for, for you, uh, for today, we are talking or concentrating on the advanced certificate. And this offered through our part-time studies uh, program. Uh, most of the courses uh, for the advanced certificate are online. Uh, but we do have an option for a couple of courses that you can come in and uh, take the courses face-to-face. Uh, but not all of them. Uh, again, most of them are online, which makes it a bit easier. After you finish work, you know, you can uh, start working on your assignment at 8 or 9 or 10, depending on if you've got kids or not. Okay, so advanced certificate, but we also have two others, and uh, 
I know that some other people were picking up brochures over here, so I'll just briefly mention them on the next two slides. We have something called an advanced diploma uh, and a bachelor of technology. Oops, go back one. So the um, advanced diploma um, is meant for people that already have a bachelor's degree, so you don't necessarily want to have a second bachelor's degree. Uh, and what they do is the students will come in and uh, in the, they can do it either full-time or part-time studies. In full-time, they come in, they spend from September till uh, May, uh, not, uh, I guess, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, or maybe probably a lot longer than 5 o'clock uh, to get their advanced diploma. And then we also have a Bachelor of Technology, which has the same courses as the advanced diploma, uh, but uh, the students also have to get uh, some extra liberal studies and management courses uh, and some job experience in order to get that Bachelor of Technology. Now when I mentioned we have our advanced certificate, so the advanced certificate um, I did say is meant for people that are already have, have a career and they just want to add to it, but there could be in some cases they say, well I just maybe want to get my feet wet in it. I am already a civil engineer, but maybe I might move into GIS in the future. Uh, by taking the advanced certificate, uh, the courses that are in here, uh, you can then apply many of them into the advanced diploma or the Bachelor of Technology, something we call laddering. So you don't have to retake those courses over again. Okay, so uh, taking a look at entrance requirements, so for all three of those programs, they have identical entrance requirements. Uh, could be you have a BCIT diploma, so you might have went into geomatics or um, natural resource uh, or mining, uh, and you say, well, I'd like to now take uh, one of our programs. So you can do that, or an equivalent. So if you went to some other technical uh, college and you have a diploma from there, um, that would work too. Uh, lots of people come to us already that have that uh, university degree. So lots of UBC, SFU uh, students, after they do their degree, they come here for the hands-on uh, practical experience. Or if you do not yet have either of those two, if you have two years of university, uh, then, uh, so it has a minimum of 18 credits at the second year or higher, then you can also get into any of our three programs. Okay, so for our uh, advanced certificate program, it is 100% online, but again, there was those couple courses. If you do really want, uh, you can come in here and you can do those face-to-face. -face. Uh, you can, I figure, uh, finish it off in probably uh, a year and a half. Uh, I realize that people are working, so uh, you can't take all the courses at once, otherwise you, you wouldn't be able to work and do the courses at the same time. Uh, but if you are a really busy person, we do give you up to five years in order to complete that. Just say, well, what are the courses? Now, you might have taken a look at the card uh, that you had uh, when uh, you came in. So I have uh, the list of our courses here. So these are, there's seven courses that we have for the advanced certificate. And we take you from sort of the very beginnings, so the learning about the fundamentals of GIS, and then some hands-on work with ArcGIS, and then we work our way down until we reach the, the last course here, which we call our capstone project. And in the capstone project, you make use of the skills you learned here to solve a problem, hopefully for, for the company that you're working with. And uh, here's our structure of uh, the program. Uh, most people, or the way that I, I see it working, uh, is people will take these first two courses, the Fundamentals of GIS and uh, the ArcGIS Level 1. So those are the first two courses that were on uh, that previous slide. So these are your base, or I call the foundation courses. After you take those, uh, then we have these four middle courses here, which is the, the Remote Sensing, our Mapping and Cartography course, uh, the Database and Big Data course. And uh, this one says day demand management and analysis. That's ArcGIS level two. Okay, so we take those ones after this, 
And finally, when all six of those courses, uh, you take the capstone project. Uh, you might also see here we have number of credits for these courses. So these six uh, courses are each uh, three credits, which they're typically about two hours uh, lecture and one hour lab, although sometimes it varies depending on uh, which course you're with. Uh, you'll see the capstone one is, is worth double the number of credits, so it's more effort that you are going to sp be spending more time on that project in order to get something useful out of it that you can deliver to uh, where you're working. Okay, so I thought I'd go over quickly what those seven different courses are. And um, then we'll be pretty close to the wrap up and, and the question part. So 7100, this is sort of the, the what I call one of our foundation courses, fundamentals of GIS. It takes you through the basics. So you get to learn what is raster data, uh, what is vector data, what are the different components of GIS. So the, the real basics, so that when I, we start uh, using ArcGIS and the instructor tells you to do something, uh, load this geo database with this point, point uh, file that you'll understand what's happening. You won't just have a blank stare. So we take you through again learning, you know, what sort of how the real world is organized and then breaking that up into layers of information, whether it's raster data, whether it's vector polygons, vector lines, or vector points, and then the information that you can have associated with it, what we call our attribute information. So again, we take you starting off with you don't need to know anything. Uh, we, we fill your brains with the fundamentals. And then from that, uh, what you probably would take would be your ArcGIS level one course. So that's GIS T7128. So uh, ArcGIS is, like I mentioned before, the most popular uh, GIS software, municipalities, all, just about all government agencies are using some flavor of ArcGIS, but it's also used in private industry uh, too. Um, again, I came from a, an engineering company and we had multiple licenses of ArcGIS that uh, we were using. So you'll get to learn in, in the level one uh, the different components, the different softwares that go together to make up uh, the Arc, sort of the, uh, I guess the ArcGIS family of software, the Arc Map, Arc Catalog, Arc Toolbox, how to load data in, how to do some basic map creation uh, with ArcGIS. Uh, next course I'll talk about is our remote sensing course. So remote sensing is a little bit different uh, from the ArcGIS. In, in ArcGIS you're working with, again, it could be vector data, it could be raster data. Uh, on the remote sensing side, we're always working with images or what we call raster data. So you'll get to learn about different types of raster data um, from different types of image acquisition systems. A lot of it is from satellite, but it could also be a sensor that's, again, aboard an aircraft, could be aboard a helicopter, or, or it could be terrestrial based. So just taking a picture with your smartphone, that's remote sensing as well. Uh, once you have that image, what are you going to do with it? Well, uh, we teach you the basics of how to display it, enhance it so that you can actually see some detail uh, in the image. Um, all images need to be put into a map projection, so that's something called image geocoding. Uh, when the satellite, say for example, goes over, it's not, that image isn't in any map projection. We need to put it in that so that you can then overlay it uh, on all of your existing vector data so you can do things such as change detection. Uh, other things you could do uh, on the satellite or on the image uh, remote sensing side is something called image classification. Say you uh, want to find out uh, uh, an area, what is out there. Uh, there are what we call image classification algorithms that you can run that'll say uh, this area has a certain kind of tree and there's different kinds of trees here and there's bare soil here and there's what are different land cover types are. And then from those land cover types from this we can generate out vector polygons that get fed into ArcGIS. I've got two examples of two different satellite uh, images here. Uh, the bottom one, so does anybody know where we're looking at? 
If you don't, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> it's Vancouver. Yes. Uh, the bottom one, this is an optical satellite image. Um, and uh, it's from what's called the Landsat satellite. So it's uh, probably one of the most popular um, optical satellites around. And the data is free, which is really cool. And the top one here, can anybody guess what that top one represents? It's a radar satellite uh, image. So it's, uh, this one's in the visible part of the spectrum, and this is in the microwave part of the spectrum. And what makes this cool is that uh, this sensor on the satellite is, it actually sends out radar um, from the sensor uh, uh, in space. It goes down, hits the ground, various buildings and things, and then comes back up. And uh, because it's an active sensor in microwave, it can penetrate through clouds, uh, through rain. So if it's like this right now, that radar satellite could actually still get an image of Vancouver even though it's raining. The other thing is this image could have been taken at, uh, in the middle of the night or it could be taken during the day. Because it's using its own power, its radar, it doesn't, it doesn't care what time of day it is. Uh, on the other hand, we have our optical image there, that Landsat. It needs the sunlight. So it can only give you an image like that during the day. So this uh, satellite image comes from Canada. Canada has uh, two, radar, uh, two radar satellites. Actually, I think they have a third one coming, if it's not already on, called Radarsat. That's easy, an easy name to, to remember. So Canada is, is very well known on the radar side. So that's a, a Radarsat satellite image. OK, let's uh, move on here. So You've done your um, basic ArcGIS 1 course. You want to get more knowledgeable uh, in ArcGIS. So we've got our ArcGIS Level 2 course. So you get to learn a little bit more on things such as dealing with map rejections, uh, advanced editing. So in ArcGIS Level 1, you might not, you might have been just given the data sets and you create the map and, and color things and, and do nice things like that. But you don't know, how, like, how do I change the shape? of that building footprint. Somebody's built something onto it, so I need to change it. So how do you do that? So we'll, we teach you advanced editing. Uh, data conversion. Um, you might be getting data in AutoCAD or, or for some other system. So how do you bring that into to ArcGIS? So we, we teach you how to uh, import in data from different sources, maybe having to reproject it. So that data from AutoCAD could have come in one map projection, but it's not the same map projection that you're using, so how do you do that, that conversion as well? So you get to learn really important things in, in the ArcGIS to, to extend you know, what you can do, let alone just making the nice map. How do you get that, the, those data sets? How do you display things? How do you do some customization? Okay. So I was mentioning that data is super important. If we don't have data, you can't really do a whole lot in GIS. So this course, our GIS uh, database systems and big data, uh, helps show you how to do a little bit of modeling, learn a little bit about different types of database systems, how you might want to organize your database, uh, and to be able to query it to pull information out. And we'll take a look specifically at one of ESRI's, what they call geo database, so a, say a geospatial database, because databases before uh, were just attribute information, sort of like if you think about a spreadsheet. It was like a spreadsheet of information, a bit more sophisticated than that, but now with these geo databases, we're actually loading things like satellite images, we're loading road networks, other kinds of data uh, into the database. So you'll learn about the uh, ESRI's Geo Database. And then the last part is we will take you uh, and give you some information, some knowledge on big data. So again, I was mentioned one of the big data sets that you uh, will learn about and use is called LiDAR data. Uh, there is also other kinds of big data that are out there. There's all these new sensors that are constantly relaying information through the internet. And how do you handle that kind of data in a GIS context? So. Uh, for this, this particular course, you're going to be working with a large LiDAR data set. 
you learn how to bring that into a geo database and then how do you manage and manipulate and visualize that big data with ArcGIS. And um, I think this is our, our last one before the capstone, our mapping and cartography course. So um, part is sort of in the beginning, how do you get data? So you learn with ArcGIS, you know, these are the kinds of things that I can do. This is how I need to massage the data in order to get uh, a map out. But sometimes you need to know some background to that spatial data. Where did it come from? What's the projection and datum? Or maybe I might have to go out with my smartphone or uh, a survey instrument and collect some brand new data for an area that I don't have information. So we'll teach you a little bit on the survey side about datums, coordinate systems, different types of maps, uh, map scales and how that affects uh, your data quality, as well as GPS. GPS is everywhere now. Uh, that's the first half of the course. So the second half of the course is on the cartography side. So you've got the data, you're doing stuff in ArcGIS, you want to generate out a map. So we'll make sure that you learn uh, good cartographic principles so that you make a map that's as effective uh, as possible. So you learn about map composition, how to balance things, proper use of color, um, typography, how to thematically map uh, different types of data so that, again, you have uh, good communication. You're not um, losing the message in your data. And lastly, our capstone project. So again, this one, um, use all the things that you've learned in the previous six courses to solve a, hopefully, a real world problem for where you're working. So you might be working, say, for a municipality or a marketing company or an engineering company and they say, well, it would be nice if we could do this with GIS or can you do this with GIS? So in the capstone project, you will work with uh, the instructor for that course to come up with a topic. And then once you have that topic uh, worked out, you then have the rest of uh, that period for the course to do the work that you have to do, whether it's programming, building a web map application, um, processing drone data, whatever it is that you worked out between uh, yourself uh, the company or the sponsor that you're you're working with and the instructor. So that about summarizes uh, the courses. Um, if you have questions about uh, admissions um, for this course as well as uh, the other two um, programs that I talked about, uh, there is either through email, the program advising at bcit.ca or there's a phone number, or you can actually come here and uh, believe it's in the SW1 building. Uh, you would go to and you can talk to uh, somebody there. Uh, you could also talk, again, for this session, you can be talking to myself or Mike, or um, we do also have our phone numbers and email addresses uh, for me, being the program head. So. Uh, you can talk to me about any of uh, the three programs. Uh, we also have our part-time studies coordinator, Carmen. She's not uh, uh, here today. But uh, if you have questions specifically about part-time studies, so the advanced certificate is 100% through part-time studies. So Carmen is as good a person to ask uh, as I am for that. Um, and then we also have a, our, our program assistant, D and she helps out if you have some general questions or you can't reach uh, myself or Carmen, um, Dee will be able to get information hopefully from one of the other instructors and uh, pass it over to you. Okay, so that's it for my question, or my questions, my presentation. Before I let you ask me questions, I have our wonderful coveted BCIT travel or water mug here. So I said I was going to ask a question about something on um, that I showed on the screen. So the first person to correctly answer this, I had mentioned in the remote sensing slide that there was a radar image 
Uh, what was the name of the satellite that it came from? Radar set. You are correct. So I'll, I'll, I'll pass that over to you after we, we finish the question. So um, we can just start ask. Uh, you can start asking me some questions. Well, as I said in the first few slides, everything is going to the web. If you're going to do any web stuff, you do need to have some programming as well as just all the mobile uh, devices too, Android, iOS apps, things like that. So programming is important. Um, we do, in the advanced certificate in the ArcGIS, uh, cor one of the ArcGIS courses, you learn a little bit of Python scripting with uh, ArcGIS, but we don't really take you into heavy duty uh, programming. If you, if that's really where you want to go, we do have some other courses with that we do have like a, a Java level one and Java level two, and we have a full blown ArcGIS Python uh, course as well, but those are out, sort of outside the limits of, of the advanced certificate. Now, um, it still is important uh, to have for some people that, that uh, do want to do things on, on uh, like I said, on, on the web or, or any kind of mobile stuff. And I think, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, did you go to school with a bachelor's diploma? Is that the Army Campus program or is it the Bachelor of Technology? The Advanced Diploma and the Bachelor of Technology are both offered full time here or 100% online. And um, I did have a presentation that I did uh, about a month ago. And um, if you go to the BCIT GS webpage, there is a, a copy of that streaming video. So just the same thing of me standing here talking about the advanced certificate. It was the same one for the advanced uh, diploma and the BTEC. So both of those programs are a bit longer. They have the same requirements entrance requirements as the advanced certificate. Uh, but there is more courses that you have to do, so it takes longer. The advanced uh, diploma, if you were to do it um, through part-time studies, uh, we give you up to five years for the Bachelor of Technology at seven years. Anyone else? Wow, you're letting me off easy. Ah, good question. So, um, we do offer some uh, course exemptions based on other courses that you might have taken, say at, at SFU or UBC or some other. Uh, we do, what we do require though is um, um, we have to first find out what, what courses you took. Uh, we need to know, well of course, what grades you got. And then we need to see the syllabus. So what things did you learn? And what we do is we compare it to what our course outline is. And there has to be, for us, at least an 80% match. Now the other thing is you say, well, I took those courses 10 years ago. I say, no, our, our limit is five years. So if, they're, if it's more than five years ago, then we say, well, technology and things have changed so much that uh, we make you uh, take the course over again. Sure. So the question is, uh, if you say start off in part-time studies, can you go to full-time or vice versa? And the answer is yes, you can. Now it's easier to go from the full-time program into the uh, part-time uh, because in our full-time program, we have a limited number of seats. Say for our advanced diploma plus Bachelor of Technology, we have a maximum of 45 students a year. And we open that registration up every year at no November 1st. So that was just a few weeks ago. And I checked the registration. I already have 41 people that have applied to that uh, program for September 
next year. So if you are fortunate to get into the program into full time, most people stay with it. But sometimes some people they need to. Uh, the program might be too hard for them, or their things have changed in their family life, and they have to sort of step away that they can convert into the part time studies. So it's easier to go that way than to go the other way, be, just because of that, you know, 45 seat, and that's just because of the number of computers and things we have in in the labs. Yeah. For for online, the the only re, or requirement or restriction is that you register in time for before the course a course fills up. Yeah, Mike. Sure. Well, I can say it because no one's going to yeah. hear you. Yeah. So yes, I, I did uh, think about that. I didn't uh, mention that. So there is a, a cost difference. If you go and do a full-time program, so our, our BTEC or you do our ADP in full-time, there is sort of a, a lump sum fee and it's about the half of how much it costs to do the part-time. So in the part-time, it's you pay on a course-by-course -course basis. In the full-time, they say, bam, here's your courses and you sort of get a lump sum um, uh, fee which is lower than doing it through part-time studies. Um, that being said, if you start off in part-time studies and you say paid for three courses uh, and then you want to convert into the full-time program, um, those three courses you, can, you would get exemptions for when you get into full-time but you wouldn't get a, a reduction in your, your program fees. The program fees are, are set. Okay. Next question. Yes. If you're doing part-time online studies, yep. Um, and the course requires you to use like a remote desktop of any kind, the computer you are using at that time, are there specific requirements for what the computer has to be or has to have? Um. So for all of our courses, uh, we do. Have, uh, we use a Citrix system, so our ArcGIS and our image processing software and all the uh, things that we have run through Citrix. So all you do need is some sort of a computer that has, uh, you've got good Wi-Fi uh, access and you've got a, m a modern browser. So most people would be using Firefox or Chrome uh, for example. So you don't have to have super processing speed on your computer because everything's happening server side. It's more the, the, the internet um, speed that you have uh, to worry about. Yes, yes, you're, you, we call apps anywhere. So like I said, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a Citrix uh, based environment and to get in you'd have to type in your BCIT a00 number and password and then you'll get uh, uh, the software that's available for that particular course uh, to do your work. And again, you can do that any time of the day. So if you're at midnight, you could be at home working on that. You don't have to be here. For the advanced diploma, you can do a project or a practicum, that is right. So a project is where you do the work here for a particular sponsor. So they might say, build me a web map application. So you would do that work here. Uh, a practicum is where you actually go and sit in that uh, sponsor's office and you do the work. So it's sort of like data, it could be day-to-day -day work at a municipality. For example, so that's for the the advanced diploma or ADP. If you're doing a B Tech, a Bachelor of Technology, you have to do a project. There is no practicum option for that. I would love if you would do all the legwork. So the question was to to find a sponsor. Who who does it? Is it the student that that does the uh, the legwork to find a sponsor for a project or practicum? or not. So uh, I have a lot of, I teach the course that helps um, sign you up with a sponsor. 
So I have a lot of background through the engineering company and other places that I work that I start sending emails and phone calls to people every September saying, hey, do you want a student to start to do some work for you in January? So I do usually get um, maybe two-thirds uh, of the students' uh, uh, sponsors that way. But there's still some students that they might already know, well, I work for ABC Company and I'd like to do my project or practicum, or they might know a company that they really want to work for. So then I'll let them go and start talking, or I might know somebody at that company and say, well, talk to Joe, and there's Joe's email address. So yes, so it's a bit of both. Okay, well, for s I'll, I'll say, I guess, bye to the people on the internet as well as um, sort of finish things off over here. If uh, you have any other questions that you want to ask me offline or to Mike uh, at the back, he can answer. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll see you at one of our online courses.